scared. <laughs> well, with all that we have gone through in this past 12 months with regard to COVID, it has changed so many people's perception of life. I don't know about you, but I have had many conversations with people who have started to think so much about life after death. They've started to wonder what's going on. What's happening when this COVID disease has been a worldwide pandemic? It has been something that's gone beyond country borders. There's been no government that has been able to stop it. There's been no army involved. There's been no, um, you know, no bombs dropped. There's been nothing of that thing, and yet... It has come in as an invisible killer amongst the nations of the world and we have seen the futility, how fragile we are as people. That we realise that our lives are very short and there are so many things around us. We are familiar with so many diseases that we have that, uh, that, that take people, our loved ones from amongst us but this was something that we had never experienced before, was as it were a once-in-a-lifetime experience that has probably changed us forever in the way that we think about certain things and we will probably act differently and have certain perceptions of things. And if you're like me, you'll probably end up, because of the masks, your ears looking like that. Um, so it'll be changed physically forever. But it has affected us in a dramatic way. And so people have started to think about things that they would not normally think about. In fact, even the Greenpeace and the people that are environmentalists, the news was silent about all of that things. It was constantly morning till night about the COVID virus. And that was like, that took up the news at every aspect and, and you know, the, the, wherever it was, the different countries and the different aspects, and we had the figures with us every day. But we've got to understand is that there is coming a point when the world will end. There is coming a time when the Bible says clearly that there is coming an end time, that Jesus is coming back again that one day there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth. So I'm all in favour of being a good steward of the world that God has given us. We were placed here, one of our job descriptions as the human race is to look after the earth. And obviously we can realise we haven't done a very good job about it, have we, in so many ways. But one of the things is, is that we could either pursue a life of trying to save the planet that is actually doomed when actual fact, we need to be realizing that we need to take people who will be with us on the new earth, in the new heaven. That's what we've got to look at. And so today I want to talk about that. I want to introduce to you today the subject of the, uh, of the coming of Jesus Christ, of the end times. And I want to look at it in a number of different ways. Now, one of the things that we found over the years, and it depends what you read, but there is... Even in Christendom, there's been people who have tried to set the date of the end times. That has been, been so many times. In 1666, people thought that that would be the year that the world would end because 666 was the devil's number. But it never did. In 1910, they thought it would end then because of Halley's Comet. In 2012, because of the Mayan calendar, they thought that the world will end on the 21st of December. And then just last year in 2020, the Gene Dixon uh, prophesied that uh, because of Armageddon that the world would end in 2020. I don't know if you noticed, but it didn't end. And I noticed that there's another one coming up in 2026. 
there's going to be an asteroid collision. So we've got a little time. <laughs> but, but actually, even, in, even in some people in Christians, they're trying to give a time, a day, when Christ will come back. But the Bible is very clear that no one knows the day or the hour, the time when Jesus will come back again. It's pretty clear about that all the way through. Mark 13, verse 32. But there are some things that we can look out for. There are some things, for example, Jesus issues the parable of the fig tree and he says, when the fig tree starts to blossom, when it starts to bloom, you realize that there is a change in season. There are some things going on. You can look at the sky and you can see some things. You expect certain things because of certain things in the, in the natural world, don't we? We understand there is change and we are able to perceive those things. And so Jesus gave us some things to look for and said, you will see some of these things happening, but you'll never really know exactly when, even when they're doing that. Now, for those of that maybe are here today, that are not a Christian, or maybe you're online and you're just uh, having a, a Gandhi at us, I want to just say up front that what I'm going to talk about today and for the next couple of weeks is weird. It is just a bit weird, okay? It doesn't so often do as we think to ourselves, now I don't know about you, but I didn't become a Christian to become weird. But some of the things that we will talk about, they will be kind of the things that you might imagine um, in some of these uh, kind of sci-fi movies and things that, that, uh, that you look at. But this, I want to tell you, is something that is, is going to happen. It is based on the Word of God. And the Word of God has always proved to be true. Now, some basics. The Bible is made up of 66 books with over 40 authors uh, written over a number uh, of uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but 20% of the Bible has been devoted to prophecy. That's a large chunk of the Bible talks about future events. And I want to say to you that the, um, the probability of some of them things, so the first prophecies, of course, that we were interested in was the fact that Jesus is coming to earth. There's a saviour coming. There's a messiah coming. And so there's a lot of Old Testament prophecies that talked about God sending a saviour, a messiah. Now, I just want to say to you, the fact that they became fulfilled in Jesus is a miracle. In fact, I was reading Peter Stoner, a book that he wrote called Science Speaks. And he talked about the probability of just eight of the many prophecies of Jesus coming true in one person was one to the power of uh, was one to 10 to the power of 17 in other words it's a lot of knots on the end yes in fact the book talked it talked about um, texas but obviously we don't live in texas but it was saying if you had texas and you had a dollar coin and uh, you covered the whole of texas um, 2 feet thick with um, with, uh, with, with these dollars, which I guess, are, I don't, I've never seen one, but I'm guessing they're about um, a 10 pence piece, aren't they? Something like that kind of thing. And you put a blind man in, and you mixed everywhere up, and the chances are that if he finds that one in the midst of that, that's the chance of it happening. Well, there was more than just eight prophecies. He then goes on to say, well, the chances of 48 uh, being fulfilled in one man is one to the chance of 10 to the power of 157. In other words, it doesn't happen every day. In other words, it's something that's mind-blowing, the probabilities of this, as a, and that's what happened at the first coming. They thought it couldn't happen. You, you see, you can't determine where you're born. You can't determine who your parents are. You can't determine the lineage of you. He might be able to have some influence on the way that he dies and some of the other aspects in his life, but there were a lot of things that he had no influence over, and yet the Bible spoke very clearly in the Old Testament of what Jesus would be like when he came. And now I want to say to you that the prophecies with regard to the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he will return, are 
five times more. There's five times more prophecies about the second coming of Jesus than there were about the first. So in other words, we know we can stand on good ground that God, that Jesus is going to come back again. Now, I just want to put a little caveat in here. That what I'm going to talk about over these next few weeks is my view. It's my understanding of the scriptures. <coughs> And it is the understanding, obviously, as a church, the, the line that we take. But there are people who see things coming about differently. They interpret, there's all sorts of different interpretations out there, and I don't want to go into that. There isn't time to go into that. But I just want you to be aware of that, that there are, there are Christians who have studied some of the same, uh, maybe all of the same scriptures, and have come to a different conclusion. Yes, so I just want you to be aware of that. So, but what I want to do this week, I just want to lay a foundation of what we're going to do. Yes, in other words, kind of what's, um, <clears throat> you know, what happens after Jesus returns? Where do we go as Christians? How are we going to be judged? Um, that's, uh, so this week, foundation. Next week, that. And third week, we're going to talk and just about Revelation and just take a few snapshots through Revelation. So I hope that's as clear there's mud. <laughs> um, so that's where, we, that's where we're going, yes? So today I want you to turn to Thessalonians. It will come on the screen, but you may want to follow it in your Bible or uh, on your U version uh, app, whichever. Now, Paul is writing <clears throat> to the Thessalonians, <clears throat> and the Thessalonians had been taught by Paul. He had been, been the one that had founded this church, and <clears throat> He, he had talked to them about Jesus coming again. So the Thessalonians were expecting Jesus to come back again in their lifetime. This is the, this is the context of which Thessalonians is written to. Now Paul is writing to them and he's saying to them, yes, Jesus is going to come back, but you, while you're waiting, you've got to get on with the Lord's work. You can't just, because what had happened is the Thessalonians, because they, they thought the Lord was coming, they'd had people that had died and they were concerned that they were going to miss the resurrection. They thought if they died, they're going to miss it. So Paul corrects this understanding and say, no, that actually if they died, <clears throat> they're going to be part of the resurrection. But he also <clears throat> says to them, don't be lazy. Get on with work. You've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to plan ahead. But what you've got to do is you've got to be ready. So in other words, you plan ahead, but you're ready for any time. So in other words, you could title this message, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be always ready for his coming back again. But also work as if he's not coming back. Telling people about Jesus. Working for him. And, uh, and, 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 and supporting others and, uh, and, and getting involved in what God's work is for your life. <clears throat> but that's the context for Thessalonians. And so he writes to that. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'll start at verse 13, and it says this, Brothers, <clears throat> he obviously includes sisters as well, spiritual brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Now we come to the essence of Christianity. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, 
we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That's what I want to do today, is I want to encourage you. There are three reasons that we as Christians have hope. Why you and I, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we follow Jesus, we can have hope. And the first thing is, which I've already mentioned, is that Christ is coming again. John 14 and verse 3, Jesus said this, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. In other words, Jesus was the originator of the, of the phrase, I'll be back. <laughs> and Jesus, when he says, I'll be back, guess what? He'll be back. In fact, in the early church, they had a greeting when they greeted each other. So, for example, when we greet each other, we say, hi, how are you doing? Are you okay? You know, we just have that kind of things. In the early church, they had a, um, a greeting and they said to each other, Maranatha. So they would greet each other with this, uh, with, this, uh, with this phrase. And it simply meant, our Lord is coming. So every time they greeted one another, they would just say, the Lord is coming. Maranatha. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. He's on his way. He's coming. In other words, there was great anticipation amongst the early church of Jesus coming back. They lived with that anticipation, and we today should live with the same anticipation that Jesus is going to come back again. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 <clears throat> says this, And now the prize awaits me, this is Paul talking, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who long, <clears throat> who eagerly look, forward to his appearing. <clears throat> that probably means most of us won't get it. In other words, there's a crown there for people who are looking and longing for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing. You see, the problem is for many of us, we love the world too much. We love the things that we see. We love the things that kind of grab our attention. And we are so busy with things that won't last when we should be living our life for things that will last. And if we lived our life in the light that Christ can come back at any moment, I wonder how we would change in the way that we live. I can only imagine how we would live. But if we just look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is rewards in store for us. Now, I understand that if you're engaged to be married, <laughs> that you're probably not going to be that eager for the Lord to come back. You're probably thinking, Lord, just give me a month. <laughs> At least give me some time, Lord, for, uh, for, for me to be with my spouse. But other than that, <laughs> we should be looking and longing for Christ to return. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14, the same chapter, verse 14 says, We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe, let's read this together, that God will bring with Jesus those who have what? Fallen asleep in him. In other words, this is not saying they've fallen asleep in church. Yes? It's not like some of you guys, maybe on the back row, that you're kind of taking the opportunity for a snooze, or maybe you're online and you've got it going and you're thinking, well, they'll think I'm plugged in, but really. <sighs> no, it's not talking about that. This is a graceful way of saying that they have popped their clogs that they have, I have died. It is the same word that is used for Lazarus. He said, Lazarus slept. We knew Lazarus was dead and Jesus rose him from the dead. He'd been dead for three days. And so it's used common, a common word that's used 
uh, for a word for people who have died. So let's look at verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet call of God. I think just stop there for a minute. The Lord himself will come down. The Lord himself will come down. And then it goes on, it says this. Now we remember God spoke and the creation came into being. And we know that God often whispers. With, uh, with Elijah, it was the still, small voice. Often God whispers things to us. But at this occasion, when Jesus returns, he says it will be a loud command. In other words, it's going to be an audible voice. It's going to be audible, so audible that we are everyone in the whole world is going to hear it. That's some noise, isn't it? And there will be the voice of the archangel Michael. The trumpet of God will blast. I wish I had a trumpet to blast. I knew how to play it, of course. To give it a, some, we know that if we just add on here a single trumpet blast, that it penetrates, doesn't it? Now you might think to yourself, well, why all this commotion? I want to tell you why all this commotion. Because the greatest event in the history of the world is happening. Because God is getting what he's dreamt of. Because he has returned what was lost. Because in the Garden of Eden, when mankind was separated from him forever, and he sent his son Jesus as the first part to pay the price so that you and I could become family of God, called sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. We could be in the family of God. Here he says, you're in and I've got me family. I'm no longer just longing, no longer just yearning, you're mine and you're with me forever I think that's worth celebrating that's why there's a trumpet sound that's why there's the archangel Michael who is the leader of the angels and he says come on come on church of Jesus Christ he is coming for us hallelujah and then when that happens what's going to happen he says then and the dead in Christ well, what? Stay dead? Stay in the grave? Come up later? Will what? Rise first. So in other words, if you go to be with the Lord first, you have to die. For us here today that are alive, that if Jesus comes right back right now, we are going to be in second place. We're not going to be first. It's those who have gone before us that have been sold out for Jesus that will be going up first. And just as we saw in that video, you know, people going up, it's going to be an amazing, an amazing sight to know that the dead in Christ will rise first. That means the people who have believed and have died. Now, there are two resurrections. And this often can be a bit confusing for people, but there are two resurrections. There's the first resurrection, which is for Christians. And then there's the second resurrection, which is later for those who have not believed, who have not followed Christ, who have refused to bow the knee to him. This second resurrection is known as the resurrection of the dead. They're judged differently, and I'll talk about that next week. It's called the Great Resurrection white throne. Now, you're in this judgment. You're in the second resurrection if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, the moment we give our life to Jesus, God writes our name in his book. It's in there and no one, no devil in hell, no human being, no power anywhere can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No height, no depth, no nothing in all of creation, no power, no nothing can separate us because of who he is. So in other words, the second resurrection is for those who will not, will bow the, the people who are not part of, of God's book. They will be punished eternally. And that's why we understand this hell. Now here in Thessalonians, Paul is talking about the first resurrection, those who were Christians. 
And Christians are judged at what is known as the beamer seat of Christ. In other words, they're judged for the good works they've done, and we will be rewarded for the things that we've done. In other words, this is not about being in or out. This is about we're in. Now, what's the benefits that we get? What are some of the things that we will get when we are at, uh, when, when we, when we uh, meet with the Lord forever? So, in other words, you can be born once and die twice, or you can be born twice and die once. Yeah, we got that. So, in other words, if we're all born physically, yes? So that's the first birth, and then we die physically, yes? And then the soul is still alive. So although physically we have died, there's still a soul. So the good news is, is that if you are born again, you have a second birth. I wonder if there's anybody in here who wants a second birth. Because I know that's what I long for. Every day is saying, Lord, keep me alive in you. Born again. It's a spiritual birth. So when you become a follower of Jesus, you are born again. You are born spiritually. You become a child of God when you give your life to him. The old life has gone and you are completely made new. You have a new mission. You have a new purpose. You have a new identity. You are new creation. Unfortunately, too many don't live out that, but we can. It's there for us to live out. So maybe you've heard people say, you only live once. Yeah, you only live once. Well, Christians, I, I find actually that when people say you only live once, they usually say that just before they do something stupid. Yeah, they're about to do something stupid, you go, well, you only live once. <laughs> anyway, but Christians can say, you only die once. That's what a Christian can say. It's I'm only going to die once. So born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. So in other words, instead of your law, you can say your door. Your law is you only live once. Yes, your law. But for a Christian, we say your door. You only die once because you're a Christian. So Christ is coming back again. That's the, uh, the first point. The second point is about the rapture, that living Christians are taken away. That's what the rapture means. It means we're going to be taken. Verse 17 says, After that, we who are still alive, that's us guys if you came today, and are left will be caught up together with them, that's those that died before us that were believers, yes, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive will join with them. Now this word caught up uh, is a Greek word, uh, hapazo, um, which actually means to seize, to snatch, or to take away to safety. So I want you to imagine for a moment that this is like you see in the movies, where this van comes screeching up, and there's somebody walking along the road, and this couple of guys jump out of the van, they grab that person, they pull them into the van, close the door and speed off. You got the image? That's the kind of thing that will happen. In other words, Jesus is coming and he's going to snatch us up to safety. He's going to make us so that we are with him and we will escape many of the things that are to come afterwards. So it means that we are going to be grabbed, we're going to be saved we're going to be snatched, as it were. We're going to be caught up with him. Now, with regard to the rapture, there are four views. There is pre-tribulation being caught up, because the tribulation is when a lot of bad things happen. Really bad. Bad, so bad that things have never been seen like that before, and the Bible talks about that. So there's those that are believing pre-tribulation. There's those who believe in mid-tribulation. In other words, they believe that after 
because the tribulation is set for seven years and they believe that after three and a half years, that's when they'll be raptured, just before the worst of it. And then there's the post-tribulation who believes that when uh, the, the, the church gets taken up after we've gone through all the horrible stuff. Yes? And then there is the pan-tribulation. They're the people who just think it's going to all pan out in the end. <laughs> they don't really have a view. They're not sure what's going to happen. Okay? Now, I personally believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. And uh, the reason for that is because I, I feel it makes the most sense in the context of the passage. And secondly, being caught up and rescued from something that has already happened seems a little bit pointless. Yes? You've gone quiet. It's okay. You're all thinking, ah, have I lost you? Are you still with me? <laughs> yeah. That's good, that's good, that's good. So, this is where we are. Now, Jesus describes it this way in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, are kind of Jesus explaining what's going to happen in the future. And he said this, this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Are you ready for this? Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. And then Jesus says this, so you also must be ready. Yeah? You must be ready. So in other words, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready. Say it with me. Get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> get ready, get ready, get ready. What do we need to do? Get ready, get ready, get ready. Can't say it fast enough, I understand. So in other words, you could be at a barbecue and one of you goes and the other's left. You could be in church this morning. And one of you goes and one of you is left. This is what, what he's talking about. In other words, we need to be ready. It could happen at any time. And so let me ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready? That's a big question, I believe. Are you busy doing the work of the Lord? Are you busy sharing your faith with others? Are you busy knowing that Jesus can come back at any moment and you are being prepared. You're living a holy, sanctified life and you are living for Jesus. You're fully devoted for him because that's what God is looking for. Unfortunately for too many of us, we are not doing that. We're half-hearted, we're lukewarm, but I believe we should be thinking Maranatha. Maranatha. This morning when you leave the church... As you're going out, maybe if you do get to, to say anything to anyone, or you're at home, just say that, Maranatha. If you say to your neighbours, they will look at you and think, they're definitely weird. <laughs> They've thought it, but then they'll know, okay? So, anyway, but our Lord is coming. Now, there are, with regard to the rapture, you've got to think about this practically, because there are two types of people. There are clothes and there are nudies. I don't know if you go to bed, whether you go to bed with clothes or no clothes. Now, if you go to bed with clothes, <laughs> yeah, all those that go to bed with clothes, that means all those that didn't put their hand up, disgusting. <laughs> I'm disgusting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I tell you, this is what happens, you see. But you see, you've got to be, because why does he go on on that? He says, he says, because you've got to remember, we'll be taken, we'll be gone. Don't be embarrassed. Jesus advises us to be clothed and ready. So if you're going to go to bed, go to bed. <laughs> Get some good pajamas, okay? Or at least have them at their bedside ready, okay? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yes. Now, okay, he might be speaking metaphorically, and there is obviously spiritual application to this. But just in case... It's best to keep some clothes handy. So there we go. So there's the return of Jesus. There's the rapture of the church to meet with Jesus. And thirdly, there is the reunion. Christians will be with God forever. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 to 18 says, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be, okay, say this with me, we will be with the Lord forever. That's right. We will be with the Lord forever. In other words, we're going to be face to face 
with Jesus, we're going to be with him. Now, when this happens, there's going to be no more pain, no more sin, no more destruction, no more heartache, no more bitterness, no more brokenness, no more disease, no more sickness, no more poverty, no more starving children, no more divorce, no more loneliness, no more cancer. Jesus will wipe away every tear. And it's going to be a new life. Something that we all long for. So Maranatha, comfort one another with these words. The Lord is coming back again. And we should live with a sense of urgency to share the gospel with people about what we're doing. Time has gone. I was going to tell a little story. A little story is about a pastor that was on a mission trip. Should I tell you? Have you got time? Are you sure? Okay. This is what this pastor wrote. He said, I was on a mission trip years ago in Ecuador with my family, and we were with the leader of Compassion International. The guy was called Wes Stafford. And uh, that's not the pastor, that's the uh, international leader of Compassion. And we were in one of those, these most broken, improvis- impre- impoverished places I've ever seen. Many of you have been to a place like this before. This particular house was for a single mum with seven kids. It was about the size, this is for seven kids, of my master closet, he said. It wasn't big in our terms. The water would wash through that, uh, that whole house when it rained. The village picking up all of the trash and urine and other stuff and would wash it through a house because a house was on the lowest part right by the dump that smelled so bad. The whole time I was fighting the urge to vomit. And so we're in this house, and I'm just overwhelmed with emotion. And Wes said this, would you like to minister to her? And he said, I'm embarrassed to say, I just froze. I was just like, I don't even know where to start. And so there was this awkward moment, and then he kind of graciously stepped in and grabbed this precious lady by the shoulders and said, I know you love Jesus. And I just want to remind you, he's coming back for you. He's coming back for you. And one day you will be with him forever, where there will be no tears. Your children will never be hungry again. They'll never be sick. They'll never be worried about about them. No man will ever beat you again. You'll be comforted by the Lord. And she was just bawling her eyes out, and my wife's bawling her eyes out, and my kids are bawling. And I'm trying not to bawl, and next thing you know, I'm in the middle of an ugly cry, you know, all of this, tears and we walked outside and I was embarrassed. I was like, I, don't, I, I didn't know what to say to her. And then he did this masterful God moment with her and I was like, I'm a loser. And he said, hey, you know, don't worry, he said. Where you minister, you don't have the opportunity that I do because they know how bad this world is. And so in contrast, they long for heaven in places like this. And he said something that he said he'll never forget. If the people in our world only knew how great heaven was, they wouldn't love this world so much and they would long to be with the Lord forever. They would long to be with the Lord forever. I wonder, do you long to be with the Lord forever? Because one day our physical bodies are going to be transformed. Things are going to be completely changed. There's going to be things like we've never seen before. Yes, the perishable will become imperishable. The mortal will become immortal. We are just going to see something different. I'll finish with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not through anything we do. We can never earn our way into heaven. It's all because of Jesus. He was born 
and he was born in a lonely birth. He was born of a virgin and he lived and lived a, a sinless life and he became the savior of the world when he gave his life for you and for me. The sin of the whole world was laid on him. And so today, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter what you've done. Today, his arms are open today to say, I love you and I died for you. And I want you to live in light of knowing that I'm coming back for you. That this isn't the life that I planned for you. I have a life way beyond this life. A life where there is no more pain, there is no more problems, there is no more tears. Today, will you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? I'd like to give you an opportunity for that, whether in here today or whether online. And if you'd like to say today, you say, I've not been living as I ought to have been living for Jesus. I wanted to live today. I don't know if I'm in or if I'm out. Today, you can be sure that you're in. You just have to say yes to Jesus. And if you'd like to do that today, why not just do an act and say, just in front of God, just say yes to God. Yes, Lord, I want to be in your kingdom. I today, for the first time, realize that I'm, I'm not where I should be. I'm not doing what I should be doing. But today, I realize it doesn't matter how hard I try, I can never be what I need to be. I don't feel good enough. God says, it's not about how good you are, it's how good he is. And he's a God of mercy and a God of love. And today, maybe you know, whether you're online or in here, you might want to raise your hand and say, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to be, I want to make sure that I'm in to heaven. That when Jesus comes back, whether he comes back today or he comes back in a thousand years' time, we don't know how long. We know things are speeding up. We know things are coming to an end. We know there's so much things we're watching out for. It could, it could come at any moment. There are still things, I think, that have still got to happen before he comes, but we can see him. Maybe today you've given your life to Jesus and you've just said, and you've just realized as you've listened today, you've realized, I need to be right with God. Today I realize I want to make sure that Jesus is coming back for me. I want today, maybe today you're saying, I want to make a commitment today to Jesus that I'm going to live with urgency in my life. I'm going to live with expectancy. I'm going to live with Maranatha on my mind and on my tongue that you are coming back again for me. If you're, that's your situation today, then please just you know, either raise your hand or see someone afterwards, go to the connect point. If you're online, again, there are people there uh, to connect with you. There is nothing else. This is the greatest decision that you can ever make in your life is to turn to Jesus Christ. Everything else in life, where you live, the house, the car, the finances, the health, it doesn't matter, everything else. Because everything that you can see is temporary. But the things that are important, the things that really matter are unseen. And one day we are going to be with Jesus who we cannot see at this moment in time. But one day we will see him and we will be like him for we will see him as he is one day and I hope that you today will take that on board and see God move in your life thank you